A very warm good afternoon to all of you. I'm Sakshi, welcoming you all on behalf of Net Zero Alliance India and First View Group to our exclusive webinar on Net Zero Energy Roadmap, Glass and Ceramics Industry. I take the pleasure of thanking our speakers here for extending their immense time and support to help organize this event and a very special mention to our presenting partners Tata Power and Sunshow for being our crusaders here. As the global focus on sustainability and climate change intensifies, industries are increasingly seeking ways to reduce their carbon footprint and transition towards more sustainable practices. The glass and ceramic manufacturing industries, uh, which play a significant role in various sectors such as construction, automotive, and consumer goods are no exception. To align with the global net zero energy goals, these industries are developing comprehensive roadmaps to achieve carbon neutrality and minimize their energy consumption. Our webinar today will outline a net zero energy roadmap specifically tailored for glass and ceramic manufacturing industry. The glass and ceramic industries have a significant opportunity to contribute to global sustainability goals by implementing a net zero energy roadmap. By prioritizing energy efficiency, renewable energy integration, material efficiency, waste management, r and and employee engagement, these industries can transition towards carbon neutrality while maintaining competitiveness and ensuring long-term sustainability. Collaboration among industry stakeholders, government, and the research community is crucial to accelerate the adoption of sustainable practices in the glass and ceramic manufacturing sectors. I would now request my team to play the commercial video for our sponsor, Tata Power.
Thank you so much, team, for playing that video. May I introduce Mr. Vikram Dhankar from Tata Power to give the presentation for his company. Thank you, Sakshi, for setting the tone for the session and uh, showing this video to everybody. Uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Vikran Singh, uh, and uh, I look after the core, after the distributed solar project for all the clients, uh, corporate clients in North India for Tata Power Solar. It had been around 12 years since I've been working in the solar industry. And uh, uh, before we dive into the today's session, let me first take this opportunity to thank all the attendees who have spared their, I mean, precious time from their working hours and that too especially in the first uh, few days of the week which are quite busy and uh, who have just uh, i mean come here to uh, gain some knowledge about uh, what are different ways towards the net zero uh, mission so uh, as uh, sakshi has already told there are different ways of uh, uh, going towards net zero energy efficiency, uh, I mean, open access power and different other things. Taking into uh, consideration the time availability, I'll basically uh, focus on uh, one of the ways uh, of doing it, which is basically the behind the meter, that is the solar projects within your facility. Uh, uh, it is also uh, the in intent of this webinar is not to tell you about what Tata is all about. I guess that in that specific thing has been done by this video, but uh, we will uh, focus on uh, more on the knowledge sharing so that the people uh, who have come here uh, get away with uh, some information in hand. So may I just have the liberty to share the screen, Sakshi? One Sure, you can see a screen share option. Yeah, yeah. To the mic. I hope it's visible. Yes, yes, it's visible. So, uh, I won't tell what Tata is all about. Most of the people are aware of it, but yes, uh, uh, I'll take a minute to tell what Tata Power Solar is all about. And that is more important because when we talk about solar, uh, we talk about a long-term investment. It's basically 25 years. And the capital investment is, investment is also quite considerable. The minimum investment of uh, uh, 200, 250 kilowatts starts from a CR. So it becomes important to, while deciding uh, what which EPC you should go with, that you, it becomes uh, important to know the uh, legacy and the history of the company. So to your surprise, Tata Power Solar happens to be the only Indian company which have been in the market for last 32 years. Uh, we uh, started our operations in 1991. At that time, since nothing much was happening in India in the solar domain, we were in jo joint venture with a company called BP. So most of our production was actually getting exported to Europe. That means at that time also, the manufacturing facility was as per the European standards only. Since 2012, we are a 100% subsidiary of Tata Power, which also uh, happens to be 108 years old company. And uh, uh, we Tata Power happens to be India's largest integrated power company. That means we are into transport, I mean, into transmission, generation, distribution, trading of power. We are present across the sup supply chain of the power industry. In last uh, 10, 11 years, we have executed around 11 uh, 0.5 gigawatt of ground mounted projects and around 1.6 gigawatt of rooftop projects. So that is the credentials uh, we have. We also happen to be India's largest solar EPC company consecutively for last eight years. Uh, this is our brief uh, portfolio as far as uh, the utility scale ground mounted projects are concerned. You can uh, see that most of the projects are, uh, I mean, in central India or south India. So. Uh, whereas there are different reasons to it, but technically speaking, uh, there are basically three, three main reasons. First of all, as we move, move towards south, the solar radiation, that is the solar intensity keeps on increasing. So it is uh, uh, for every one kilowatt installed in south, suppose in Tamil Nadu or Karnataka, generates a bit more than the same capacity 
installed in North India. Secondly, uh, the land is also a bit uh, cheaper as compared to states like Haryana and Punjab. And thirdly, and most importantly, is the uh, state policy. For instance, in Karnataka, you can see around 1150 megawatt was done. Uh, whereas in all the surrounding states, it is not adding up to that capacity because there at one instant of time, the policy, the state policy was quite uh, convincing in Karnataka. So this was a brief about the utility scale projects. I'm sure my industry colleague from Sunshore will, uh, I mean, express his views on the ground mounted project, but I like to focus here on the rooftop aspect of it. Uh, as far as rooftop is concerned, we are present across the length and breadth of the country. And um, I mean, I hope this uh, slide gives you a, a pretty good understanding of that. Um, I've already told for the last eight years, consecutively happened to be India's largest uh, solar uh, company. Uh, these slides are also, uh, I mean, just to educate you, just to give you an idea of different ways of implementing solar and sort of myth busters. Like this specific slide is uh, for the intent of uh, busting the myth that uh, solar can be installed only for uh, 50 kilowatt or 500 kilowatt or one megawatt, not more than that. So this specific project uh, happens to be one of the largest uh, solar projects in the world on a single roof. Uh, this single uh, shed is spread across 32 acres and uh, this single project accounts to around 16 megawatt that is 16,000 kilowatt so this uh, at uh, at a point of time this happened to be world's largest solar rooftop project and uh, that too to your surprise is on the cement sheet not even the galvalum sheet this is again a concept of solar carport so uh, we happen to meet so many customers who say or oh, we want to put up solar but uh, we don't have sufficient space within our facility. I mean, when we talk about space, the rooftop space. So at in front of, I mean, few of the uh, industries like uh, Maruti, we have recently uh, putting up a huge carport over there. So they have huge area available, which they utilize for the parking purpose. So in this specific concept, we don't end up wasting the ground. You can use that ground for parking. Then the water, which is used to clean the modules, is also not wasted. It goes to rainwater harvesting pits. And thirdly, there is an EV charger under every uh, such arrangement. So if you will park your car and by the time you will be back from the airport uh, after seeing some of your dear dear ones off, so your EV will also be charged. So it's a multi-purpose application of a solar project um, which is called as solar carport. Then this is uh, the concept of floating solar, wherein we make the models float on the water. After doing few pilot projects uh, of 500 kilowatt, one megawatt, uh, last year itself, we have executed this 101 megawatt uh, of project in the backwaters of Kerala, which happened to be one of the largest solar floating projects uh, in, the India, in, in the country. So this was just to give you an idea of different ways of installing solar. There's an, again a concept of BIPV, wherein we integrate the solar along with the design of the building. So these are different ways of installing a solar project within your uh, premises. These are a few of our prestigious clients. Then uh, just for the benefit of everybody, because uh, people might be with different uh, backgrounds. So this is a basic working principle of a solar rooftop project. So, uh, Uh, one sec, one sec. Yeah. I hope, okay. So basically you install the modules on the roof, solar modules on the roof, and when the solar radiations fall on it, they basically generate the DC electricity. Whereas the load which is in your industry is basically running at three phase 415 volt AC. So to convert this DC power into AC electricity, you basically need a PCU or you can say power conditioning unit or in basically an inverter. So uh, this inverter basically does three functions. First of all, it converts the DC electricity into AC electricity. Secondly, it ensures that at any instant of time, the generation from solar is in synchronization with the grid. So if suppose the grid is uh, at 49.9 Hertz, so 
the solar will also generate at the same frequency. Uh, and last and most importantly, it ensures that solar gets first priority over any other form of electricity. For instance, if your uh, facility has a running load of say one megawatt and you have installed a 500 kilowatt of uh, solar rooftop. So first uh, 500 will come from the solar and rest of the 500 kilowatt will come from the grid. Now you can assume that so many people come to us saying ki, uh, the generation would be quite less in winters or else on a cloudy day. So on a cloudy day, let us suppose this 500 kilowatt uh, gets reduced to 200 kilowatt. So again, this 200 kilowatts uh, gets consumed uh, on the highest priority and rest of the 800 kilowatt then is taken from the grid. And this entire process keeps on repeating after every microsecond because it's a microprocessor based algorithm in the inverter. And you will never come to uh, realize how much you are uh, getting from solar and how much you're getting from the grid. So this is a brief understanding of uh, how does a solar project work. You can also see these two arrows these are just to uh, give you an idea of net metering. So basically, uh, for, depending on the state policy, there is a facility of net metering which is available, wherein uh, just in case you are generating more than your requirement, so the surplus power will get exported. So this outgoing arrow is uh, showcasing the export of power and the inward power arrow is showing the import of the power. Ultimately, the user, the uh, uh, the factory owner has to pay only for the net power uh, which is uh, consumed. So this is a brief uh, working principle of a solar project. Talking on a bit on the commercials, Tata by nature uh, doesn't believe into puncturing the roofs because uh, while dealing with a lot of customers, so many people don't even put up a solar project on their roof because with the fear that it will lead to water leakage on their roof. So forget about uh, installing the project on a roof, but on, on a GI shed, even on a RCC roof, it is our uh, first intent that we avoid doing any puncturing on the roof. So we basically use this uh, concrete uh, foundation or a blast basically as a dead load and multiple such uh, blasts are then interconnected, which prevent the modules to be flown by the wind. So this basically acts as a dead load, which has an inward is a downward force, which prevents the modules uh, to fly in event of a wind. This is a IHC, this is a specific design is, uh, I mean, is compliant to IS-875 standards and uh, it can bear a load of about 180 kilometer per hour wind speed. And we have installed more than 100 megawatt with this specific design in last uh, uh, 12 years or so. When it comes to uh, installation on a GI shed, basically uh, we, uh, I mean, install parallel to the shed using different methods. In this specific method, we basically, uh, this is a long rail method here. We don't, we don't end up doing multiple holes on the shed. So with very minimal number of holes on the shed, we end up installing the uh, project. Secondly, the load because of the solar is also getting passed to on the purlin, not on the sheet. So the, there are different ways of installing the project on the uh, shed. This is uh, what we uh, usually prefer and recommend to our clients. Uh, I had happened to uh, one sec. Never mind. I mean, okay. So we'll after the structure part comes the module. The solar module is basically, as I've already told, we are into manufacturing for last thirty-two years now, and uh, it's the, it, it is only the solar module which lasts for twenty-five years. The, the life of the solar inventory is around around twelve to thirteen years. Uh, this is the most lasting, and it also incorporates around sixty-five percent of the project cost as well. So Tata happens to be a manufacturer of its own. We don't uh, buy the models from outside. It is our in-house production based up in Bengaluru and now coming up into Ch in, at Chennai. So we uh, uh, are manufacturing our own modules. So 
you need to understand that while uh, opting for a module uh, right now basically different technologies are available so we are offering you uh, mono park modules with a minimum voltage of 540 which is as on date the most uh, utilized technology in the industry after module comes the inverters so uh, again inverters are also manufactured by uh, and a third party vendor for specifically for Tata Power Solar. So they are co-branded uh, inverters. Uh, usually there is a warranty of around uh, five years in the market with an option of buying the extended warranty up to 10 years. With Tata Power Solar, you uh, by default, you get a warranty of uh, 10 years. So that's an, again an, another USP in our offering. There is, these inverters are also with multiple MPPTs. So uh, if something happens with one of the MPPTs, rest of the inverter will keep on working and that does not hamper the entire output of the inverter. So there are different technical aspects to it. Probably we can discuss them into one one to one meeting. Uh, There is also a remote monitoring facility which is given with every solar project. So you don't need to go on the roof or go on the site to check how much is your solar power generating, solar project generating. So you can, I mean, access the generation and all the other information about the solar project on your mobile application or on the online portal. Uh, then comes the safety part of it, uh, which is, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, in the Tata's uh, framework, the most important thing uh, and uh, which needs to be uh, taken care of because it's a highly distributed market. There are more than 3000 companies working in the domain. So safety is uh, something which uh, sits at the rear seat in most of the installations which we come across. So uh, talking of the safety, basically uh, safety is of two types. One is uh, the safety of the shed and the other is the safety of the people who will be working on the roof. So for right now, uh, when there is no installation on your roof, so nobody is working on the roof. But once the solar project will be installed, there will be many people who will be working on the roof, which can lead to wear and tear of the roof. So basically to avoid any direct contact with the sheet of the people who will be working on the roof, we have this uh, walkway, basically, this is a galvalume walkway of the same material of which your shed is made. And um, so you basically prepare this dedicated path so that people walk on the walkway and don't, uh, uh, I mean, put their feet on the shed. Along with the walkway, there is a safety line which also runs so, so as to uh, avoid any um, somebody falling on off the roof. This is another project which was installed wherein there was a, uh, uh, these are the walkways. After the safety of the shed, as I've already told, uh, the most important thing is about the safety of the people who will be working on the roof. So uh, wherever there will be a walkway, there would be this stainless steel um, SS304 safety line, which will run across the walkway. And the, anybody who will be working on the roof will harness himself to this uh, SS304 safety line through this carabiner, which will walk, which will move freely on this road. So this is for the safety of the uh, people uh, who will be working on the roof. The third aspect of the safety is uh, the handrail, because there have been instances we, we wherein we have come across when the people have fallen down from the edges of the roof. So for that specific aspect, and especially where the, wherever the tilt of the roof is more than 10 degrees, it becomes even more important to uh, think about the edge fall protection. And that is where these handrails come into the picture. Uh, and lastly, and but not the least, this is the most, uh, I mean, commonly seen incidents which happens on the sites. Basically, you use these polycarbonate sheets uh, for natural lighting purpose. And uh, uh, if anybody will put their feet on it, they will have, they will fall down from the roof. They will fall down from the roof. So to avoid any such, uh, I mean, uh, safety hazard, we cover, we cover all these skylights through a skylight cover. This, this is basically a wire mesh arrangement wherein we cover this entire arrangement with a 
this cover and anybody who will happen to put his feet on it will not fall down. So this is again uh, an important aspect from safety point of view. You can so see this uh, one of our installations and wherever there is this empty space. So we have happened to cover these uh, skylights with uh, these uh, powder coated uh, skylight covers. Again, one of our installations wherein the skylight was around 90 meters long. So we have happened to cover it uh, through all those skylights with the covers. Um, I mean, a lot of people to, are also have a myth that solar is quite costly. Whereas I do understand there's a huge capital in, uh, investment initially, but yes, the payback and ROI calculations are also very impressive. This is just a, uh, I mean, just to give you a ballpark idea of the commercials and uh, basically the ROI and payback calculations. I had worked out a sample 500 kilowatt project uh, at Haryana. So I have assumed that uh, if you have happened to put up a 500 kilowatt project, and I've also considered very uh, conservative numbers so that you uh, don't assume that by taking very aggressive numbers, we have tried to uh, show the lucrative results. So whereas the actual generation would be much more than uh, 13 lakh units a year, I have just assumed that a 500 kilowatt will generate at least 13 lakhs in a year. Then I have also assumed a very uh, conservative tariff. I will only consider the energy uh, part of the tariff. I have not uh, considered the fixed uh, tariff into it. Then I have, uh, whereas the na national average is more than 4%, I have considered an escalation in grid tariff at the rate of 3%. I have considered that you will put, on, put up 30% of your own equity and you will get 70% of your project finance through any bank or NBFC at the rate of 8% for 10 years. Right now, this rate of interest might also be a bit, a bit on the higher side after the recent repo rate uh, increase in um, last few months. I've also considered a corporate tax of 25% because there is an accelerated depreciation benefit on solar. So you can depreciate your asset by 40% in the first year itself. I've assumed that uh, uh, the project will cost you somewhere around 2.25 CR a mega and uh, I've also assumed the operation and maintenance cost for next 25 years and also the insurance cost. That means all of those expenses which can incur in your solar project have been considered into this model. So if we run this cash flow for next 25 years, the results are these. So your equity, uh, whatever 30% equity you had uh, invested or put in this project gets uh, the, the payback comes in somewhere around one and a half or two years. And the entire project, uh, the payback comes in somewhere around four or at the most four and a half years. Some of the people also say that we don't want to take this AD benefit due to the nature of the business or other uh, shortcomings. So in that case, the payback will shift by another one year. Even then, in the worst case scenario, with a payback of around four, four and a half, five years, you get free electricity for next 25 years. But this was a brief about the commercials. Lastly, these are few of our corporate clients. These are satellite photos. So you can just see uh, these are few of our clients within we had executed the project. So with the interest of time, uh, that was it from my end. Uh, if you happen to have any query regarding uh, any of the solar project requirements, it might be a rooftop project, it might be a ground mounted project, it might be an open access project. You can be in touch with us. You can probably take the screenshot of this slide. It has my all the contact details. We would be uh, happy to help you in, in your mission towards the solar. Thing. Thanks a lot. Thank you uh, to the organizers for giving me an uh, opportunity to interact with uh, all the people. And uh, that's it from my end. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Mr. Vikrant, for that insightful presentation. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, I would now request my team to play the commercial video for Sunshore.
Why should you go solar? Did you know that India is now producing the world's cheapest solar power, the cleanest source of energy in the world? So what makes solar so attractive? Of course, you make massive savings on electricity bills, but there are also great tax benefits on solar investments. Let's simplify this for you. The price of solar energy remains fixed while the grid costs go on increasing. So your savings go on increasing year on year. Over its lifetime, a well-engineered plant saves over seven times its investment. It's environmentally friendly. A 500 kilowatt solar plant helps offset CO2 worth more than 4,000 trees every year. Sunshore Energy is the complete solutions partner on your solar power journey. We help you from conceptualizing your solar investment to commissioning of the assets and its operations over its complete lifetime, all from under one roof. We are a team of IIT Illuminus driven to propel India into a solar-powered, energy-sufficient future. We are right now the largest rooftop solar company in India, aiming to create a portfolio of 1000 megawatts of solar power assets by 2022, with running projects in over 15 states. Corporations can transition to solar power through rooftop solar while larger power needs can be fulfilled from open access solar plants. These plants are set up far from the premises and the power is delivered directly to the facility. With the combination of rooftop solar and open access, large corporations can shift up to 90% of their energy to solar and bring down power costs by 40%. We will assist you in navigating the complete financial landscape of the project and also guarantee best-in-class energy generation from solar plants we create for you. Our expertise in site surveys, assessment and compliance with the highest international standards for our designs ensures complete satisfaction. A dedicated project manager ensures that the project is planned and executed with world-class quality and safety standards. Timely delivery of the project is monitored closely with the aid of daily progress reports till the project is handed over to you. Post commissioning, the asset management team provides performance assurance to your plant. This is achieved with our timely maintenance schedules and advanced analytics practice on real-time data from the plant. You will receive business grade reports on a daily basis and all major system events will be brought to your notice. Sit back. Relax and watch the sunshine turn into gold for your business. Thank you so much, team, for playing that video. Uh, allow me to introduce Mr. Kartike Sharma, who is the co-founder of Sunshine. Thank you. Thank you, Sakshi. Um, thank you, Vikrant, for uh, you know taking the audience through uh, the very detailed presentation. And uh, I'll actually I have I have a short presentation uh, where you know we'll talk a little bit about Sunshot and then uh, talk about how the uh, ceramics and glass industry can uh, actually think about going to net zero. And we'll have a special focus on achieving RE100, which is uh, you know one of the biggest parts of uh, achieving the net zero ambition in India. And uh, so I hope everyone can see my screen. Sakshi, could you please confirm? Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay, that's great. Then. Um, so. Just a little bit about myself. I am Kartikeya Narayan Sharma. I am one of the co-founders at Sunshore, and I am also chief of strategy. Uh, been uh, with Sunshore from 2015, and uh, we have been uh, one of the pioneers in uh, working with the CNI space in India. And uh, over the last eight years, we have set up close to 300 megawatts of solar power plants across various business models, uh, whether it is behind the meter rooftop or ground mounted or open access across 15 states in the company. And we have worked with over 60 corporations 
uh, to help them decarbonize their energy supply. Very recently, we have raised $400 million from Partners Group. And with that massive funding behind us, we are uh, now an independent power producer and are targeting a 3 gigawatt of uh, commercial and industrial renewable energy capacity by 2027. What sets us apart from uh, a lot of other uh, companies operating in this ecosystem is that we are a full stack power producer, which means that we do everything from government permissions to land acquisition to the actual installation of the project and then asset management completely in-house at Sunshore. Our partners, partners group, uh, are one of the largest infrastructure investors in the world and have over $140 billion in assets under management and over 9 gigawatts of renewable energy assets globally. This is their first foray in India and Sunshore is the uh, exclusive company through which they would be investing this $400 million, uh, which is aimed at putting up 3 gigawatts of RE capacity by 2027. We offer power and decarbonization services and products for the entire spectrum of decarbonization for corporate corporates, whether it is, you know, plain vanilla solar or wind or hybrid solar wind with battery energy storage. We have all the uh, capabilities and projects in place to start supplying, you know, round the clock power uh, to large corporations. We also deal in green attributes. So whatever scope three uh, emissions that you might have uh, and, and want to offset through purchasing green attributes, we help our customers do that as well. And we also help companies set up the right kind of structures so that they can execute virtual PPAs and create, you know, green attributes for themselves, even in places where they are not uh, consuming power actively. Some of our customers, and I wanted to especially highlight our glass and ceramic customers, which include Kajaria Ceramics, Hindware, Dalmia Group, and GSC Glass, uh, with whom we have uh, executed very large projects. And, uh, you know, the, we, we very, very well understand the challenges that the glass and ceramics industry faces in India and their power needs. And uh, in this presentation, I will also be talking about some of the specific uh, ways in which the glass industry can look at decarbonizing. This is just a quick look at our operations currently. So we have around one gigawatts of uh, shovel ready projects that we are signing PPAs for. Uh, with large corporates. These are spread across intrastate plants and also interstate plants. So intrastate open access plants in Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka can help customers, you know, who have power requirement in the range of, you know, 5 megawatt to maybe uh, 25, 30 megawatts within these states. But if you have larger requirements, if you're looking at round the clock power in the range of 50 megawatt or 100 megawatt, then maybe the best choice for you is to go through interstate renewable energy projects. And we are setting up a large 450 megawatt project in Rajasthan, which can supply power for any, any requirement across the country. Setting up a large wind plant in ISTS in Tamil Nadu, uh, which will be complementing the solar and ensuring that you get round the clock power supply from renewable energy plants. Now the next stage of my uh, presentation deals with, you know, how the glass and ceramics industry can actually think about moving to a net zero paradigm in India specifically. So, you know, the way we see net zero is, uh, or uh, we feel that, you know, corporations should look at net zero is across three primary pillars. One is that, you know, you have to decarbonize your heat or power use. And uh, as we are all well aware that the glass and ceramics industry uses a lot of heat uh, specifically for melting the glass. And uh, that is the biggest source, almost source of 70% of their emissions actually comes from this heating or power use. And uh, for that, uh, you know, of course, I know a lot of companies are already moving to hybrid electric furnaces, furnaces and uh, alternative fuels for their uh, heat consumption uh, and going for overall electrification of the manufacturing process. And uh, once you do, you are able to do this, you can actually start buying green power from the grid through open access, or, you know, you can set up an on-site uh, solar power plant 
which can help you bring down the power you need from the grid so it helps you save a lot of money and i'll talk about that in the next few slides but it also helps you uh, you know uh, decarbonize your operations and move towards the net zero point because that's really something which the markets are now demanding and uh, uh, the ceramics industry is a you know glass and ceramics industry is a consumer facing industry and a lot of consumers are now evaluating their choices uh, and looking at brands for you know what what they basically stand for um the other two parts you know the circular economy, economy uh, practices there i feel that the glass and ceramics industry already has a advantage because there is a you know most industries use a lot of uh, collet uh, for you know creating recycled glass and uh, a lot of raw materials also because you know we i'm aware that you know glass is, is a very fast evolving commodity and a lot of companies are innovating in fact some of our customers are innovating uh, you know at a great speed to make sure that uh, they are able to make their end product more sustainable and of course you know uh, recycling practices in the glass industry are are top notch already but i guess that needs to flow down further and uh, that will help you know uh, chop off a major chunk of uh, decarbonize of, of you know the carbon footprint of this industry and the last one is the supply chain decarbonization uh, which is basically once you have your house in order your heat and energy is coming from renewable energy your uh, waste is getting recycled and you are able to create a circular um uh, uh, value chain uh, the next thing is that you know your suppliers uh, you should encourage your suppliers to adopt more and more renewable energy uh, for economic reasons and and also for uh, you know climate uh, for tackling climate change so across these three things you know the the lowest hanging fruit that i feel is energy use right which is also 70% of your overall carbon footprint now the the best way to or the biggest way to offset your energy use carbon footprint is by uh buying power right green power it can be open access or it can be on site on site power typically because we have a space constraint uh is able to offset maybe 10 to 15% of your power use uh, if you have enough space uh but for bulk of your uh, power consumption you know open access Uh, remains the only feasible option and but if you go for both you know between these two you can offset close to 75% of your energy use and the remaining 25% you can actually buy green attributes and uh, with that with these three things alone you can actually you know go 100% uh, uh renewable energy or green power so i'll be focusing the rest of the presentation on on open access and how it works uh you know this is just a basic layout right so open access is nothing but you know you are on the right side you are a bulk power buyer and we are sunshore is on the left side we we will set up a private power plant for you which will be feeding power in a remote substation so for example in maharashtra you might be operating in a taluja or a ahmednagar uh, but we will set up a plant somewhere in solapur which will set up uh, which will sell power uh, through the existing infrastructure right so what happens is we get a connectivity permission at a remote substation we buy land we set up the project we sign a ppa with you and then supply you power through the grid uh one very interesting thing about open access is that it lets you bank power so just like uh, you know we saw uh, net metering in rooftop uh, this is very similar to that uh, in in open access and um, what it does is that you know on a sunday maybe your factory is closed or running on a single shift but solar plant is producing a lot of power so whatever excess power you are producing you can actually use it any time during the month um some crucial call out you know power by our contract demand should typically be above 1 megawatt uh, this could be across two three facilities also uh, but it would make sense to because the transmission line and all of those infrastructure would only make sense once you have you know a demand which is above 1 megawatt so that is to be kept in mind uh there are charges associated with transmission and wheeling through the grid so that is over and above the uh, solar price so that needs to be kept in mind uh, but what's interesting and i'm showing an example from maharashtra so maharashtra today you know the grid prices are something like 9 rupees 35 paisa what you see on the right but if you buy power you know solar power under open access um you can contract at a basic price of around 3 rupees 80 or 4 rupees per unit and all the other charges transmission charges distribution charges impact of losses banking charges and other charges all combined right come to close to 2 rupees 
15 16 paisa uh, and your power landed to you is under 6 rupees so you end up saving anything from 37 to 40% per unit of power and and this is a massive saving right a massive economic reason for you to uh, adopt open access solar um, some things that you need to keep in mind uh, especially for the glass sector right glass and ceramics uh, the load is is very volatile we understand that you know if you have like a 2 megawatt demand then your power load might go from 2 megawatt to 1.5 megawatt in a matter of 5 minutes as you go from heating to cooling and uh, in in that kind of a case sometimes rooftop solar or behind the meter solar can actually become a hindrance uh, because it it you have to uh, curtail them if you are you know if you are ramping down very fast um, uh, so that you don't feed it into the grid because larger plants will generally not get net metering um, but uh, but in open access you know you don't have that problem so open access you can just look at what your monthly power curve is right so what you see on the graph here on the left is uh, the the blue portion is actually the demand uh, power demand we see more demand during the uh, festive season right october to february march and then uh, lower lower demand between july to september um, but solar production is actually the opposite so you should think about you know how much capacity you are signing up for so that you are able to use all the solar power you uh, generate within those months and then the other thing to watch out for is what is the capacity uh, that is giving you the maximum savings right so typically there is an optimum point uh, where you can get maximum uh, displacement and maximum savings so for example in this particular case case we saw customers consumption and we we simulated various scenarios and we found that 6.3 megawatt capacity was giving them a 55 percent displacement of power and helping them save almost 12 crore rupees a year. So these, these kind of analysis are important. Um, but, but once you are able to take open access, you know, the, the benefits are amazing. Uh, there are generally promotional waivers uh, on transmission and wheeling charges, on cross subsidy surcharge and additional surcharge. You are not, you don't have to pay when you're doing open access in captive mode. You don't have any risk to project development technology or operations because we will set up the entire project and we will simply be selling power to you. And this power, you know, you can, we will give you a fixed tariff for 15 to 25 years. So a big chunk of your power, sometimes even 75% of your power, uh, you can fix the price for the next 15 to 25 years, which is uh, a, a very, very uh, strategically beneficial thing for any industry today, especially in the face of rising coal prices and a lot of inflation. Overall, you're able to, you know, drastically reduce your scope to emissions and are able to, uh, you know, make a name for yourselves as a sustainable company. Uh, in a typical open access project, you know, you, you take around six months to deliver power. Uh, but it's important that you, you understand that the project from which you're buying power already has the requisite permits and has the land in place. If those two things are in order, then, you know, signing a PPA and getting power supply is like a four to six month uh, game. And then you get fixed prices for the next 15 years. Some of the large success stories in the glass and ceramic sector, uh, just for example, these are, these are just publicly available information. So Kajaria and Hindware have done, have both done large projects and have been doing for the last six, seven years. Sumani Ceramics very recently has signed a 50 megawatt solar power uh, PP. And Sera, also a very well-known name, name in ceramics, has signed a 10 megawatt uh, PP. So we are seeing a lot of adoption in the uh, glass and ceramics project uh, space, industry space. And I'll just show you a few pictures of some projects that we have done for ceramics majors. This one was for Hindwe. It's a 10 megawatt rooftop solar power plant, one of the largest uh, rooftop solar power plants in the country when this was set up in 2018. This is a 17.5 megawatt ground mounted plant for Dalmia cement. This is in Odisha. This was set up uh, just a year ago. And uh, this is a 10 megawatt project, which we are setting up for Kajaria right now in uh, UP under open access. Um, open access projects, the best way to do them is in a captive structure. So where you own 26% of the equity in the SPV and we own 74%. And uh, you own this equity so that the project can qualify as a captive project. And uh, that gives you certain benefits. Uh, but as far as the risk is concerned, we will try and you know offset all the risk uh, reasonably possible so that you don't have to, you know, be accountable for the debt and so on for the project. 
So that's it. That's that's uh, from my end, and I look forward to uh, insightful conversation for the rest of the webinar. You can contact me uh, as per this slide, and I look forward to connecting with all of you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for that knowledgeable presentation. Here, I would like to make a small announcement. The attendees can post their questions in the Q&A box, and our panelists here will take up those by the end of the uh, uh, knowledge presentation. May I now introduce Mr. Rishab Patidar, who works as a research analyst at the Council's Industrial Sustainability and Competitiveness Team at CEEW. He aspires to be at the forefront of the ongoing energy transition and sustainability movement, concentrating on industrial decarbonization, clean fuels, and sound energy policy through a techno-economic appraisal of emerging technologies. Over to Mr. Patidaria. Hi, thank you, Sakshi, for a quick introduction. Uh, I'll share my presentation. Uh, and let me know when it's visible. Yes, it works. Visible. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, so, thanks for uh, India and uh, the Alliance for inviting me uh, here. So, this is regarding how can glass and ceramic industry. Uh, achieve a net zero. Uh, so how can, and my topic here will be the horizon technologies. For example, one of them is green hydrogen, where government is also pushing a lot from past uh, couple of years. Now with a new national green hydrogen policy being introduced there. So this discussion and this presentation will hover around like how a glass and ceramic industry can utilize green hydrogen to be a net zero uh, industry. And what are the opportunities and challenges associated uh, in this, uh, uh, in the use of green hydrogen in this sector. Uh, giving a little background of what uh, CEW, where I belong to, is. So CEW stands for Council for Energy, Environment, and Water. So we are a policy-making institution uh, where we use data, integrated analysis, and strategic outreach uh, to uh, to transform uh, the various sectors. For example, uh, the low, car low carbon economy in the energy transition, power markets, industrial sustainability, where I belong to sustainable livelihood and to provide the quality of life such as clean air, sustainable water, food, cooling, mobility. And we do all this by using some enablers like how to justifiably use sustainable finance or te technologies for the future, circular economy, climate resilience, and international corporations. We are a team of uh, 250 plus now multi multidisciplinary people uh, reviewed and uh, uh, published 320 plus articles. Uh, and we have been a part of more than uh, 450 roundtables and conferences. And we engage with a lot of state and uh, central ministries. And our main aim is to develop policy frameworks for the state and central governments. Uh, and we have even some special initiatives like Center for Energy Finance, uh, where we provide some assistance to, uh, to, to the governments, like how can they procure the easy finance powering livelihood areas, uh, uh, emerging economies, and a, a dedicated UP state office. Uh, so this is what a brief introduction of CEW is. Uh, coming to the presentation, like what this presentation will cover. So here we'll uh, gain uh, some insight about uh, how a glass and ceramic industry in India is, uh, what is the energy consumption need, because that's how uh, we will be focusing on like where green hydrogen can be used. Uh, how can hydrogen substitute this energy demand? What are the existing opportunities that green hydrogen offers? And what are the upcoming areas where green hydrogen can be utilized? And con, uh, con, coming to the cost dynamics of it, like how expensive or uh, how cheap uh, fossil fuel uh, pro processes or fossil fuel based fuels are as compared to the green hydrogen. And how is government playing a role to push this industry forward? And uh, how 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 uh, how we how are we going to uh, follow this roadmap to de decarbonize this uh, glass and ceramic industry? Uh, coming to a little background about how glass is manufactured, we all know that uh, uh, we use limestone, silica, and all some components. We mix them, mix them in a furnace, and then uh, several step process goes in. And the main component of uh, uh, the industrial utility is uh, heat and uh, uh, electricity requirement. 
uh, and india produces around 7 million tons that is the uh, figures for last to last year before covid uh, the 7 million tons per annum of uh, glass production uh, where this glass uh, 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 there are several categories of glass that are used uh, be it uh, uh, container glass the flat glass the there are table glass squares there are specialty glass there are uh, reinforced fiber chitin glasses etc uh in all uh, maximum share goes to the container glasses which is the most common ut- uh, u- uh, <clears throat> utility uh the energy requirement to produce 1 ton of glass for example is around 5 to 7 gigajoules uh, and it produces around 0.5 to 0.7 as a thumb rule this much amount of tons of co2 per ton of glass manufactured now if you see the energy requirement of 5 to 7 gigajoules around 85% of the energy is made from fossil fuels that is nothing but natural gas which is now used to uh Uh, natural gas used to uh, for for the for uh, in the burners to melt this uh, glass uh, and here is a typical uh, bre- uh, typical break uh, break even uh, break uh, break out of the prices the, that is the average specific energy consumption of different types of glasses using different types of uh, furnaces that are used so on an average we can assume that around 5 to 7 in this technology has kept on improving from past 2 or 3 decades but overall globally uh, the manuf- glass manufacturing process has constantly uh, has has always been the same and uh, very less modification has been done till now so this is a brief about glass manufacturing and coming to the ceramic sector which is equivalently the same uh, where around uh, the amount of ceramic uh, ceramic sector produce is uh, measured in terms of how much meter square of ceramic is produced because mostly the output is uh, vitrified tiles or the floor and wall tiles Uh, so uh, as of 2021 around 2.6 billion meters square of ceramic tiles are produced in india alone uh, where uh, china being the majority share around 55% of the global share of the uh, ceramic industry is produced in uh, china while in india around 2.6 are uh, uh, 2.6 billion meters square around 50 or around 70% of the production is from morbi in gujarat uh, the energy consumption here we see that uh, we use uh, it also uses a lot of natural gases and uh, electricity requirement for the for the heating and uh, the furnace processes uh, coming to the emissions point, point of view around 0.2 to 0.3 tons of co2 is emitted per ton of co2 since we also measure it in terms of meter square so around 3 kg co2 per meter square of uh, emissions are, uh, are <clears throat> produced from the cement uh, from the ceramic sector Uh, out of which around 92% of the thermal energy uh, uh, <clears throat> energy is consumed in the form of thermal energy the rest 8% being electrical uh, while around 95 91% or around let's say 90% of the co2 emissions are mostly are from the natural gas combustion so the point is a uh, whole of the furnaces which uses natural gas for glass and ceramic industry how can this natural gas can be replaced in an alternative fuel so that lesser lesser emissions can be achieved Uh, now people have used green hydrogen in uh, this sector and there are some upcoming research that is going on uh, very less limited research is available for here uh, but if you see what are the challenges like for example this is a very delicate industry so uh, whenever there is some change in the temperature or oxygen percentage or in co2 percentage uh, the temperatures uh, and all so uh, the color of the glass is also an important parameter changes the hardness or the Uh, <clears throat> uh, the strength of the glass that matters, which also changes, so that is an important aspect to look upon. Uh, now, considering like uh, the burners which are used here, which are the natural gas burners, uh, now if this technology has to be introduced, hydrogen burners has to be evolved, and very less research is being uh, done in this area. Uh, another aspect related to not directly from the glass and ceramic sector, but from higher hydrogen use perspective, is around about the quality and safety of uh, hydrogen. Uh, also the cost dynamics uh, because as of now green hydrogen costs around 5 4 to 5 dollars per uh, uh, 4 to 5 dollars per kg uh, which is very expensive in terms of uh, it can be utilized by the industry uh, but if you see what are the opportunities in the sector uh, like india imports a lot of natural gas and since we don't have lot much of natural gas reserves uh, we are uh, dependent on natural gas from for the uh, dependent on natural gas from the other countries uh, replacing this with the uh, green hydrogen we can reduce the natural gas imports also there are some uh, research by xand goben which is one of the major uh, glass glass product uh, producing industry they started using 30% of hydrogen blend as a pilot in a pilot study so this is a very recent study in, came out in april also there are some uh, 
uh, European projects. Uh, there is a UK uh, ministry uh, which uh, has proposed a high glass project, uh, uh, which uh, and then they have published a result on how what are the impact of using hydrogen in this glass making. And they say that this that is pro uh, promising. And if the cost dynamics of this green hydrogen comes down, they can definitely go for this. Also, there are some international efforts which are uh, ongoing in this sector. Uh, so these are the several projects across the globe where hydrogen is being used uh, for glass manufacturing. For example, in Japan, a Nippon Electrical uh, Electric Gas Glass Company uses around 100% of hydrogen uh, there. Here, hydrogen blending means uh, initially the sector will uh, repurpose this natural gas and blend some hydrogen in it so that uh, they can know the uh, technical economics of the process and how the process can be handled. And then uh, the increasing share of hydrogen can be mixed there. Uh, no projects can be seen in, as of in India, but uh, the, as the research progresses, uh, there will be quite a few projects which will be coming in India. Uh, most of the projects are centered around Europe. For example, it is high net clicking and uh, where and mostly people are using 100% hydrogen, mostly in the pilot scale. But on the commercial scale, they have also used 20% hydrogen blend, 30% hydrogen blend, and 35% hydrogen blend also. Uh, now coming to uh, like what is the opportunities for green hydrogen? Uh, what are the existing and the upcoming opportunities? The existing opportunity here uh, entails are like hydrogen consumption is used in refineries, fertilizer, and methanol for now, which is around 5.6 mtpa. Uh, by 2030, India aims that uh, they can produce around 5 mtp of green hydrogen, which is also highlighted in the National Green Hydrogen Mission. Uh, of which we will need around 100 gigawatts to produce this, to achieve this 5 MTP target, we will need 100 gigawatts of RE capacity, that is solar and wind combined. Uh, uh, instrument which goes into producing uh, hydrogen is known as electrolyzer, uh, which will has a separate cost economics and will need around 40 gigawatts. And to achieve all these uh, things, we will need around 100 billion dollars of investment for this 5 MTP. Now the benefits of this is, like you will reduce 1.6% of the reduction, CO2 emission reduction. Now this seems to be a very, very less figure, but the amount of CO2 that uh, global, globally or India produces is very, very high and 1% is a very significant amount. Uh, we'll reduce the imports, that is the natural gas imports that we are dependent on. And if we produce this much, we can around reduce around 68% of our uh, LNG imports and around $5.5 .5 billion of our revenues will be saved. That can be utilized. <coughs> Uh, for more progressively in the sectors <clears throat> which we are focusing on. So this is the existing opportunities for green hydrogen uh, coming uh, coming to how expensive this hydrogen is. So as of now, hydrogen is produced from natural gas, uh, which costs around, uh, the, the fuel cost is uh, around $1. There is maintenance and capital. Uh, so overall, it comes around $1.4 or to $1.3 per kg of natural uh, hydrogen produced from natural gas. Now, if we consider that we want to produce this hydrogen in a green form, so this is a cost analysis of uh, our internal assessment, which says that if you are solely dependent on solar, the cost of hydrogen produced will be around 4.75, let's assume $5 per kg. Uh, with wind, because we have a higher PLF factor, which is uh, 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 three point, with which we can achieve $3.7. And if we use wind solar hybrid, the cost will be around $3.5. Still three times significantly higher than the cost of uh, natural gas produced from cost of hydrogen produced from natural gas, which is essentially known as gray hydrogen. So the left part is the gray hydrogen, right part is the green hydrogen. So we can see that it's around three times costlier. Now this assessment is based on, uh, based in uh, Gujarat state where solar and wind price are sig significantly lesser as compared to other parts uh, because of the uh, better solar and wind availability in that region. Now, if we see the cost of natural gas is around $3 billion per MTP. And if you produce this green hydrogen, which is around 21 billion per MTP, which is around seven times costlier than what we are producing. So what are uh, what are those nudges which government can do to reduce this price gap? So uh, for them, several companies are also propagating this uh, idea. And there are companies such as Linde, which is also a big gas manufacturing company. Uh, has partnered with Nell, which is an electrolyzer company, saying that we can reduce the cost of green hydrogen to $1.5 by 2025, that is in the next two years. Also, Reliance and State Style uh, are focusing on this area and they say that by 2030, we will achieve one, one, one strategy, which is achieving $1 in a decade by, tw by 2030. 
and also omium which is one of the electrolyzer manufacturer located in bangalore uh, but they say that they can achieve this cost of one dollar per kg of hydrogen by 2025 so these are some of the promising things which uh, are in this region but still we compare if we compare uh, from, from the gray hydrogen price it's very very less competitive also till now coming to if this uh, hydrogen price is achieved what are the upcoming opportunities in this phase there are several sectors like steel sector mobility sector hydrogen blending and natural gas which is where a uh, glass manufacturing uh, industry can utilize this that if this hydrogen can be blended with the natural gas steel uh, sorry uh, the glass and ceramic industry can directly use them uh, we also assess like how much potential of uh, each sector is there for example steel sector can take up to 2.7 mtpa of green hydrogen mobility based on this much or uh, 24000 of uh, electric vehicles are there than this and if hydrogen blending is achieved uh, the potential is around 0.65 mtpa where the glass and ceramic industry can focus on and it will need an investment of around 13 billion dollars uh, to uptake this and if we combine all these costs uh, will around 78 billion dollars of uh, investment be required achieving seven uh, and will need around 70 gigawatts of wind solar hybrid uh, now how government is pushing this green hydrogen and how feasible they are going to make it with this uh, so this is the timeline of national green hydrogen mission how government is pushing this so it begins from the year of february 2021 where national green hydrogen mission was announced the union budget uh, on 21st on uh, august 21 uh, in the independence day speech uh, nghm was announced and it was approved in january 23 this year uh, approved by the cabinet and this year june that is uh, three three four months back there was a phase one to incentivize uh, the electrolyzer which i told which is the main heart of the hydrogen production to uh, to incentivize this uh, electrolyzers so that is that will result in a lesser uh, cost of this green hydrogen product production and, and uh, just uh, last month or uh, last to last month uh, there are also the bidding processes which are still going on uh, and the objective of this national green hydrogen mission is to achieve 5 million tons of green hydrogen uh, this will attract an investment of 8 lakh crores uh, resulting in creation of 6 lakh jobs and will reduce the uh, imp uh, reduce our uh, uh, imports by 1 lakh crores uh, which is the aim and to produce this 5 mtp of green hydrogen it will need around 125 or around 100 gigawatts of renewable energy uh, where glass and ceramic also plays an important role because that is what is used in the manufacturing of the solar uh, pv modules uh, this all will uh, propagate and their uh, aim is to reduce the co2 uh, reduction uh, to achieve the co2 reduction of around 50 million tons that is around uh, one percent that we already discussed one point one to one point five percent of co2 emission reduction now how is this the uh, national green hydrogen mission uh, committing its support so for this they have allocated around 2.6 billion dollars which is around 19,000 crores uh, in this uh, so they have uh, proposed a plan that we will have this four components inside this uh, strategy which is first the site scheme which is strategic interventions for green hydrogen trans transition uh, the pilot projects will be supported in this areas for example how hydrogen can be used and what kind of uh, investment uh, investment and pilot projects are required for example let's say hydrogen use in ceramic industry and in glass industry uh, r d uh, sector where around 400 crores has been devoted some mission components which are the external uh, extra agencies uh, uh, for this for the purpose so the major investment which is around 2.3 billion of 2.6 billion around 90 percent of this covers inside site scheme uh, which is a financial incentive mechanism for example someone in the last letter they said that uh, some electrolyzers are being uh, electrolyzer manufacturers are being provided the incentives uh, which is around one for this uh, they're proposing around 1.7 billion dollars and around extra, extra 600 million dollars for incentives and for focus on hydrogen production uh, there are uh, several pilot projects will be used for example green steel green ammonia is one of the sector transport shipping hydrogen hubs and valleys along with this glass and ceramic industry can also participate in this e equally uh, where uh, since the, the stage is in the r d stage so it will cover in the ship scheme uh, where railway is also part aviation is also part and also some new technologies are also a part of it uh, the aim is to uh, create demand so that uh, 
uh, once the demand is uh, achieved people will start uh, producing this even on a larger scale and even the cost dynamics can fall down and for this a special framework has been supported support supporting ecosystem has been provided by the government uh, as we discussed that the site scheme which is around 90% of the uh, whole outlay of this budget is being allocated in the site scheme uh, where electrolyzer manufacturing is a small part of it and the main five objective of this scheme is how can we incentivize green hydrogen green how can we incentivize the production of green hydrogen using electrolyzers how to achieve a uh, levelized cost of uh, hydrogen to be in range with that of natural gas uh, how can this industry be competitive in terms of quality and terms of performance uh, how can we uh, enhance the domestic value creation uh, so that more and more uh, local companies can uh, produce uh, and how to establish this promising technologies and supporting the other industries along with it uh, so for this uh, uh, seki has been uh, authorized as the implementing agency uh, uh, to to take care of this part and for them they have assigned that the, the timeline begins where with the consultation market review performed in the last year uh, now the notification incentive schemes are all are in the way and the implementation will carry on till 20, 2030 Uh, for this, uh, Seki, as I told, uh, they can uh, they can inspect any uh, applicant manufacturing units or offices, and based on the following guiding principles, uh, they have uh, introduced like what are the base incentives uh, if uh, someone qualifies for this project. Uh, so they have proposed around four thousand five hundred rupees per kilowatt of the electrolyzer capacity, uh, which will be uh, used to produce green hydrogen, and the incentives will be provided for. Five years from the date of commencement of the manufacture of the electrolyzer uh, application. So uh, below is this snapshot of uh, uh, the Ministry of Nat uh, New and Renewable Energy, that is MNRE, uh, hydrogen division, where uh, they are saying that these are the guidelines for the proposed site scheme in the uh, in the National Green Hydrogen Mission. And for this, uh, they have they have given a selection process like which company can bid for this. Uh, if you see that. Uh, the last section is around 10, 11, 12. So these are being categorized from 1 to 12. What does this say is this about specific energy consumption. For example, as we see, we also saw that how much of energy is required to produce one ton of glass or one ton of one meter square of uh, ceramic. Similarly, to produce one kg of hydrogen, how much electricity is required. So here uh, it says that uh, any company which can produce uh, hydrogen at a lesser cost, which is on 46. So as per, the, as per normal standards, uh, as of now, with the current technology, we can produce uh, 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 we can produce per kg of hydrogen requires around 55 to 56 kilowatt hours. That is the category number 10 to 12. So if any company which can produce uh, hydrogen with a lesser cost can avail a higher multiplication factor of this incentive. For example, uh, if a company is uh, getting 4,500 rupees per kilowatt as an incentive, performance quotient if they are if they are producing as a letter, uh, lesser uh, specific energy consumption they can avail 4500 into 1.16 that is extra incentives can be uh, given to them and the focus of this scheme is to promote local uh, to, uh, to promote uh, domestic manufacturing uh, that is by uh, local value addition which is lva it says that uh, in the first year you are bound to use 40% of the domestic products and as the go, as the year goes on, as the year passes on, for example, it is still 2030. Project starts in 2025. So for five years, uh, the local value addition should increase from 40% uh, to 80% uh, year on year by 10% increase. So this is first uh, electrolyzer dependent. That is a technology dependent thing. Which, for example, there are two electrolyzers, which is alkaline and proton exchange membrane, also known as PEM. So for them. Uh, the technology varies. For example, in alkaline, it is 40% for the first year. For the other electrolyzer, ty electrolyzer types, it is on 30% initially and then goes to 70%. Uh, also, there are uh, uh, some notifications from Ministry of Power as well. For example, they have also suggested this came in uh, last, last year in February, uh, where uh, uh, they also said that 5 MTP of green hydrogen production will be there. And for them, they are saying that if uh, they can provide waiver on the interstate interstate transmission charges for 25 years if projects are commissioned before 2025.
So also they are providing provisions for RE banking if you're producing green hydrogen and using this hydrogen if you're producing the electric. Also, uh, they can be uh, there will be provisions for bunkering and uh, green hydrogen exports. Sorry, green ammonia exports because uh, ammonia is also a trading commodity where you produce ammonia using hydrogen that will be produced from this route. And this is the notification of Ministry of New, New and Renewable Energy that we already discussed, which is the budgetary outlay of uh, $2.5 billion, providing hydrogen, uh, providing the viability gap funding of around $1.5 billion for liquidizers, which is a kind of a, a PLI scheme, uh, which is uh, around $600 million, and will support the pilot projects from steel, mobility, energy, shipping, uh, the glass and manufacturing sector, and other sectors, railway, aviation, etc. And some of the mission components which are there. So this is an overall uh, outlay of how government is thinking on pushing green hydrogen ecosystem and enabling other industries to part take part in this uh, and promote India's uh, decarbonation journey and also the uh, roadmap for the uh, glass and ceramic industry. And with this, I uh, uh, end my presentation. Uh, and happy to take any questions. Yes, Sakshi, over to you. Thank you so much for that insightful presentation. I'm sure we all have a lot to learn and a long way to go. Uh, as of now, we do not. Uh, uh, we we have only one question. I'll just screen that. I believe it is for Mr. Sharma. Hi. Uh, so there is there is no banking actually on ISTS connected projects. Uh, banking is available for intrastate projects, and uh, for ISTS, unfortunately, you know, um, because typically the quantums that you buy. So see, one thing which is very important to understand uh, is that you would only go for an ISTS project if your quantum of requirement is very huge. And in that case, it is very difficult for the grid to provide banking. And hence, uh, when you go to ISTS kind of projects, it makes a lot of sense to buy both solar and wind in a hybrid kind of a mode. So you can get power around the clock. Uh, but in intrastate, you can get, if you have a smaller demand, and when I say smaller, I mean anything up to 25, 30 megawatts, then it makes a lot more sense to just go for an intrastate project where you can just use solar, get a lot of banking and be able to offset around 60, 50, 60 percent of your power cost. All right. Uh, so we have only we have only one question for today. Uh, is there anybody who would like to give any concluding remarks? Uh, Mr. Sharma, would you like to give any concluding remarks for this evening? No, I'm, I'm actually good. I, I think it's a very informative session. Uh, shout out to CEW for uh, the very informative presentation on green hydrogen and its applications and the vision for the country. And uh, thank you, Sakshi, for running it so well. Thanks, Sakshi. Do you have anything to say? Do you have anything to add, Risham? Uh, no, no. I think uh, that's enough that I covered most of the part. Uh, mostly uh, just uh, one insight that I'd like to say is that there is very less development going on in terms of use of hydrogen in uh, the sector. So more and more R&D will, need, will be needed to, uh, to promote this sector as of an India. Right. I'm sure we'll all pay heed to that. Uh, Vikram, do you have anything to add? No, actually, I'm, um, I mean, it, I'm glad that all of the three speakers covered different aspects towards the net zero thing. And uh, it was a pleasure to share this uh, this uh, session with uh, Karthike and Rishabh. Thanks a lot. Right. That's great. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, all our speakers here. It was a wonderful session for sure. And uh, a very special thanks to our audience, uh, our attendees. Uh, a big shout out to them for extending their valuable time for the event. And a special thanks to our partner, Tata Power and Sancho Energy for always being uh, there for us and to help us organize this event. We promise to be back soon with more exciting sessions in the Net Zero journey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sancho. Bye.
Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sakshi, for coordinating this event. Wonderful time.